Okay. Our next uh, speaker is our uh, honorary doctor, Hans Peter Christi. Hans Peter is professor in comparative politics at the Euro Euro European University Institute in Florence. Previously, he held the Stein Rocken chair at this university, and he has been teaching at several universities, such as University of Amsterdam, Geneva, and Zurich. His wide-ranging research interests include the study of several aspects of democracy, political communication, political mobilization, and opinion formation. In 2017, he has received the Matty Dogen Prize. Together with colleagues from the London School of Economics and the, the University of Milano, he is currently working on an European Research Council Sergi, Sergi uh, project uh, on the impact of recent multiple crises on the resilience of the European Union. Please, Professor Kreisi, very welcome. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction and for the kind uh, invitation to your university. The occasion of this lecture gave me the opportunity to think about my own research, about the development, the continuity and change in my own research. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. Originally, I was a sociologist and my thesis was in educational sociology. But with my habilitation, I moved to political sociology and then it was only a small step to political science and I became as it was said before, a comparative political scientist whose perspective over time changed from a focus on Switzerland to a focus on Western Europe and then to Europe at large. But as is typically the case with comparative political scientists, the experience with my own country, that is the experience with Switzerland, has very much shaped and informed my research and my thinking. And you will see this as I uh, show you the continuity and change of my research. Now, my research has, I thought, four lines. Uh, a research on democracy, on policy-making processes and power structures, on social movements and protests, and on political behavior and party politics. And I start with research on democracy because this is the field which links me to your university. I was invited by Stefan Dahlberg for the keynote at the annual conference of the Swedish political scientists, which took place last year at your university. And uh, because it was COVID time, I could not come, but I could on Zoom talk about the question whether there is a crisis of democracy in Europe today. And uh, as those who were present might remember, I was very, not very pessimistic about this question and uh, I was rather in an optimistic uh, mood. Now, unfortunately, because of COVID, I couldn't come here and I'm all the more happy to be here today with you. And I feel very much honored that you give me an honorary doctorate and I'm very grateful for this. Now, m my research on democracy is an example of what I said before. My example is the focus from the focus of Switzerland to Europe at large, and I started out with studying direct democracy in Switzerland. You know, Switzerland is the paradigmatic case of direct democracy. 
and I studied how it works in practice. And my studies came to the conclusion that Switzerland was an institutionalized procedure of direct democracy which avoided many of the pitfalls that are attributed to direct democracy by political scientists. So I came to be a staunch defender of Swiss direct democracy. My research on policy-making processes and power structures also began with Switzerland. And uh, for my habilitation, I studied the Swiss political elite. And we did interviews with no less than 250 of the most powerful politicians in Switzerland. And using network analytic procedures, I was able to reveal the power structure of the Swiss elite at the time, at the individual and the organizational level. And what I want to show you is a picture from these network analytical results. It's the power structure at the organizational level. And you see there are two organizing principles, a hierarchical principle, which is represented by the inner circle. So the most powerful organizations are in the inner circle and at the dead center of uh, the structure is the Swiss federal government, which is not surprising, maybe a bit more surprising is that the Liberal Party is right next to it. It was very influential still at the time of this study in the early 70s of the last century. The second organizational principle is represented by the Leafs. It's policy-specific, very influential organizations. And at the time, health policy was very important. Transportation policy, ter territorial planning was very important. And also labor uh, market issues, which are represented by labor organizations, was very important. You see the radical right is very, very marginal at the time in Switzerland. Now, after this project, I wanted to continue with elite studies, but the head of the Sociological in Institute of the University of Zurich, where I was working at the time, said either you go into a, a pro project on political protest in Switzerland, or you can no longer be employed by our institute. That's the way I became a social movement scholar. And I, I have never regretted it, I must say. Uh, at the time, we studied the development of protest in Switzerland from the, second from the end of the Second World War to 1978, when our project started. And I want to show you what I think is the most important result of that study. It's a very simple graph with two lines. A solid line which is declining from 45 to 78. That's the conventional participation in Swiss direct democratic votes. And then there is a dashed line which explodes at the end of the 70s, uh, 60s, early 70s, and which represents the protest events, the number of protest events in Switzerland. We counted, following a procedure by the historian Charles Tilly, we counted the protest events. And you see, there is really a watershed at the end of the 60s in, in Swiss politics. And this result shaped my thinking a lot. I mean, I was very much impressed from being dull and unexciting Swiss politics became rather, ra rather more interesting, let's say. Now, I became, after this project, very lucky, I became a professor of collective political behavior and social movements at the University of Amsterdam. And at that university, we continued this research, but we became more comparative. We had four countries, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Germany, and France, and we compared the development of protest in these four countries. And here you see a very important result of that study. In Amsterdam, we distinguish between new social movements, 
the ecology movement, peace movement, anti-nuclear movement, human rights movement, squatters movement, also in Amsterdam at the time, and all the other movements, especially the labor movement. The labor movement is included in all the other movements. Now what you see here, in three countries, the solid line which are the social new social movements exploded again, the protest in three of the four countries, in Germany, the Netherlands and in Switzerland. France was the odd country out. Now, why was this so? We came up with the idea that the political context, what we then call the political opportunity structure, was very important for political mobilization in social movement land. And in France at the time, until the late 70s, the Communist Party was still dominating the French left. Which means that economic issues, were very class was very important for France and the labor movement remained the most important movement in France. In the other three countries, the new social movements articulated mainly cultural issues Class was no longer so important and the new cultural issues became dominant. Now at the end of the 1980s I moved back to Switzerland, became a professor at the University of Geneva and there I became the comparative political scientist whom I, who I am now. And in fact the rise of the new social movements and later on of the radical right broadened my interest, I moved away from social movements and into political conflict and party competition more generally. And I became very much influenced by the Norwegian scholar Stein Rocken. Stein Rocken, who had a macro-historical, very ambitious theory of the development of politics and political change in Western Europe since the Reformation. So he had this notion of cleavages and cleavages are political conflicts or political divides and uh, he had especially two dimensional structure of party competition, two types of divides, economic divides, class divides and cultural divides, which were religious divides in his theory, which started with the Reformation. Now together with an American scholar, Marty Lipset, he claimed at the end of the 60s that this two-dimensional structure of party competition was frozen, stable, unchangeable and uh, to be there forever. And I took issue with this idea and in particular I claimed that the party competition structure in Western Europe was being transformed on the cultural dimension in particular by two waves of mobilization which had been taking place since the late 60s. On the one hand mobilization by the new social movements and on the other hand mobilization by the radical right, which transformed the competition on the cultural dimension from a religious competition into a competition between cosmopolitans on the one hand and nationalists on the other hand. And we call this the integration demarcation cleavage. We admitted that there should be differences between Northwestern, Eastern and Southern Europe, so this applied in particular to Northwestern Europe. Schematically, uh, this is how we construed the configuration. You had the horizontal dimension, the economic dimension from left to right, traditional left-right, and you had a second dimension, the cultural dimension, which was religious, which now we claim was integration, that is, into a globalized world, into a European Union, cosmopolitan opening versus demarcation, tradition, defense of traditional cultures, defense of the nation state. And uh, we claimed that 
on the cultural dimension, actually the new left and the Greens outflanked the old left, the social democratic and communist left, and uh, below, on the demarcation side, the radical right outflanked the old right, the conservative and liberal right. And I show you now how it works out. This is a scheme that we thought up. I show you how it worked out empirically. And this comes from a study which uh, studied the configuration of party systems in Europe pre-crisis, that is pre-Eurozone crisis, and post-crisis, that's 2008 until the present. And you see there are these two-dimensional uh, uh, configurations for the party systems in Austria, Britain, France, Germany, the Netherlands and Switzerland. On the left, you have the horizontal axis going from pro-welfare to pro-economic liberalism and vertically from the defense of cultural liberalism, the defense of European integration to the opposition to immigration, the opposition to Europe and the defense of traditional national army issues. And you have three clusters, the left cluster where we would expect it to be, the radical right cluster where we would expect it to be, but there was also a moderate right cluster of parties which were liberal both in economic and in cultural terms. Now more recently on the right you see that this, this has slightly changed because on the right of the political spectrum you have a diversification. The liberal cluster is still there but I it is now separated from a conservative cluster of the moderate right and the radical right has moved much further down. And as a result of this transformation, political conflict in Western Europe, in the Western European party systems, is mainly a conflict on the cultural dimension. So economic issues, you see the spread on the vertical axis between the parties is much bigger than the spread horizontally. Now, as it was said by Saman, uh, more recently, I have returned to my original interest in policy-making processes and power structures. We just study that now, no longer in Switzerland, but at the level of the European Union and its member states. So we study how the European Union and its member states have tried to manage the more recent crises. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now it's time for questions. I see a lot of uh, colleagues from political science here. Yeah, through, please. Thank you for an interesting presentation. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's on. Um, uh, you said that uh, we see most conflicts between this cultural dimension now, um, but you can can you say something about how you see the future trend now with economic problems? Can this economic dimension become more? Uh, important again? I, I mean, uh, as uh, Groucho Marx says, it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very good question. And, and uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, a lot of colleagues argue that uh, the conflict is not just on the uh, cultural dimension and that you cannot so easily separate economic and cultural issues as we make it out to be here. So, so there is, to some extent, uh, a, a merger of uh, economic and cultural issues. And you see it, for example, more recently, uh, under the impact of the cost of living crisis, uh, which is manifesting itself, especially 
with energy prices, the radical right in many countries is now defending uh, a, a, a cap on energy prices. So the, the, the radical right is defending the poor guys who cannot afford energy anymore and is picking up the concerns of the working class, which has increasingly uh, opted for the radical right in Western Europe. So, I mean, some radical right parties are very clearly moving to the lower left-hand corner, which used to be national socialist. And it, not they are not fascists, but uh, they have understood, as your question implies, that some of the potential for them is in the lower left-hand corner. Okay, more questions. Thank you for your presentation. It's interesting. And I have, um, since you opened up and talked a little bit about your background as and as a sociologist, I'm curious about uh, whether sociology still is part of your research and somehow or how you mix kind of the different... I, I'm still things. very interested in the structural roots of these cleavages. If, if you take Rocken, he had a, a, a three-layered idea of cleavages. There was the structural root, like class. Then there was uh, the, let's say, the consciousness, class consciousness, the belief system, the values which are related to the structural roots. And then the third is the political organization and representation. And he was ready to speak of a cleavage only if these three elements were given. And uh, at the UI now, for example, Gary Marx and Lisbeth Tore, they have a, a project which tries to show the structural roots. And I was always very much interested in this question. And if you ask me, what are the structural roots of this new integration demarcation cleavage? It's education. It's more, I, I once did a paper with Celia Heusermann where we uh, showed that education discriminates much more on the cultural dimension than class. Class is, I mean, we, we tried with, there, there is a former student of mine, Daniel Oesch, who has introduced a new class scheme. And we tried to apply this class scheme of Oesch, but education is stronger uh, in terms of the structural roots uh, of the cultural cleavage than class. There's room for another question, I suppose. Okay, no one? Good, thank you. Uh, well, um, you didn't mention inequalities. You did it maybe another way, uh, but um, inequalities is uh, seen as a big challenge. Uh, and what's your opinion about the connection between inequality and cultural differences? I mean, inequality is class. It, it's on the side of of class and and uh, surprisingly inequality in my talk but also in party competition more recently in Western Europe did not play a role. Uh, class, eco economic class issue, take Berlusconi, take uh, 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 Blocher in Switzerland, take Trump, these are very rich people. And, and, and the working class people who vote for them don't seem to mind. I mean, the, the issue is national identity, the defense. And uh, the, there is a famous paper by a guy called Shio, who has shown that for lower class people or people who have a low status in general, the national identity is much more important than for people with a high status. It is a sort of compensation for those. So if you live in a country like the United States, make it great again, then you, even if you are a poor sucker, you still are compensated by the great greatness of your nation. So I, I think the radical right 
and increasingly also the not so radical right, they play the card of nationalism in order to avoid questions of inequality and the left is not capable of insisting on these issues because apparently the others are more the other issues are more salient or more consequential for electoral behavior. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I leave this here? <laughs>